top tiers now. We're getting carried in this video. No more bad hurt boxes or low damage or shitty normals. Just a nice, relaxing time embracing the feeling of not having to work. Playing a viable character is always a good time, but today, allow me to show you what happens when a character goes above and beyond and just being absolutely ridiculous. Hope you're sitting down for some of these bastards, because they're all pretty insane. With a game like Dragon Ball Fighters, it's extremely easy to pick from a list of characters who were once insane beyond description. Remember all that spiel about how the meta of a modern fighting game could change a lot due to balance patches, version updates, and the like? Well, DBFZ, being just over 5 years old, is no different. I could easily pick from any flavor of the meta top tier and discuss why they stood out so much in an era of the game where they were dominant. Should we talk about Season 1 Bardock and his minus 1 lariat that practically made him impossible to contest during pressure, not to mention his insane normals? I could talk about Season 3 UI Goku's seemingly endless reversal and obnoxious defensive options, or I could send half the DBFC players watching into a panic attack by describing the launch version of Labco 21. Today though, I want to talk about the character that spent most of his time in the limelight during Season 2, GT Goku. GT Goku was the third character released for the second season of DLC, and he certainly made a big impact. From his release in May 2019 up until the beginning of the third season in early 2020, he was one of the most common and dominant characters in the cast. When it comes to the current meta, I still see him ranked fairly high, usually top 10, sometimes top 5, but he's still regarded as a very strong character. Nothing will ever compare to how hated he was during season 2. So GT Goku. You could probably tell from his stature, but he's obviously not a neutral monster. He's the smallest character in the game by a decent amount, with even Krillin and Kid Buu standing taller than him. Lots of characters in DBFC boast massive normals that are either very long or travel extremely far. A GT Goku does not. As you'd expect, his stubby ass normals are good for basically everything except neutral. He has his fair share of neutral tools to utilize, but they typically require meter or have longer startup, which makes them fairly committal. 5S in particular has absolutely massive horizontal rage and his 236X Dragon Flurry Fist and 214X Dragon Flash Fist are both amazing movement tools thanks to the H versions. 214H in particular will track the opponent, making it a pretty good way to get in and skip neutral as the kids say. He also has a beam and reverse Kamehameha which lets him zip around the screen. Plus, you know, assists and super dash. With these tools in hand, GT Goku can easily circumvent his lack of range. His normals serve a different purpose once he gets in, as he becomes one of the hardest characters to block on the roster. Since his 2S is a low, he has solid high-low potential and his medium buttons are excellent for stagger pressure. Once this kid is in your face, he's going to be there for a long time, which I realize is par for the course in DBFZ sometimes, and especially so in Season 2, but it's a strength nonetheless. While GT Goku can work in the point position, he finds his home primarily on the middle and anchor slots thanks to how much utility he gets from assists. GT is definitely a team player, since long ranged assists help him get in and extend combos. His own assists are… functional. Once upon a time, GT Goku A assist was top of the line, the cream of the crop in the assist market, but the shares have dropped tremendously in modern times due to some severe nerfs to its frame data. His C assist is standard for a DBFC C assist. But his B assist is actually quite nice. It doesn't have the reach of its partner assists, but it's fast and offers similar utility and combo extension. GT Goku's supers also get stronger when one or more of his allies bites the dust, a nice little bonus and incentive to slot him second or third. When GT Goku isn't bouncing around the screen like a child hopped up on sugar or making you block half your lifespan, he's likely hitting you and doing damage. Lots of it. While his damage can be resource intensive due to how much he actually needs to spend to maximize his output, more on that later, there's no denying that GT Goku can absolutely shred a life bar given the right circumstances. Add in spark and limit break and a little medium starter and you can just make your opponents fucking explode thanks to one nifty tool. GT Goku is a rare breed as he possesses two level 3 supers. One of them is a fairly standard cinematic super that acts as a high damage combo ender. The other is the Super Ultra Spirit Bomb. God, I fucking hate that name, why can't it just be called the Universal Spirit Bomb? Anyway, it's far from the only giant orb of doom in the game, but it's one of the best supers for damage utility and one of GT's most pivotal tools for cashing out in a big, big way. See, GT Goku Spirit Bomb can be comboed into fairly easily, but it can also be comboed out of. 
With a well-timed Dragon Rush, you can throw his other level 3 in to finish the combo and absolutely gut any character with just one touch and a 6 or 7 bars of meter. He can even do it solo, giving him massive comeback potential as an anchor character. Of course, it is extremely expensive, but spending 7 bars to kill a character is still preferable to just getting a knockdown and having to gamble on opening the opponent up again just to conserve meter. GT Goku may take a bit to get going, but he's ultimately an explosive character who, upon making his way in, can run his opponents down. However, this is all core design elements of the character that have been preserved in every version of the game. This segment is meant to highlight GT Goku during the peak of his dominance in the Season 2 era. He may not have been changed in numerous ways, but what they removed to tone him down was, uh, kinda crazy to say the least. The biggest change was to the Spirit Bomb, which back in the day was everyone's worst fucking enemy for one evil, EVIL property. It caused a hard knockdown. With this super, GT could knock the opponent down and gain access to the best Oki of anyone in the roster at this point. This was in an era where erasure of post level 3 Oki Zeme was still ongoing. Characters like Android 16 and Bardock became infamous in the first year of the game for how strong their pressure was after level 3 super since it scored an untackable hard knockdown. So you saw these supers very frequently due to the fact that they gave you the best opportunity to open the opponent up. While it may have seemed like everyone who could do this was having the ability taken away, it was all offloaded into GT Goku and his spirit bomb. Any hit. Any touch would lead into a Spirit Bomb combo and that would be followed up with the 4-way mix-up. It was consistent and it made GT terrifying to fight. Season 2 was also the meta of snapbacks. Players were beginning to realize how powerful snapping was at this point. In current DBFC, you can change the timing with which a character comes in after getting snapped. This was not the case in Season 2, so a snapback gave you ample time to set up a mix-up, and on certain characters with tall hurtboxes, you could set up an unreactable 50-50, which were also removed in later patches. With all that said, getting touched by GT Goku could easily turn the game into a series of guesses. Would he do cross-up or same side? High or low? Would he try to bait or spark? Not to mention having to look out for dragon rushes, it was terrifying! GT Goku was also stronger in neutral as his light auto combo traveled way further and his A assist had much faster startup. All of these strengths would get toned down in a patch much later, but due to Season 2's near non-existent patch schedule, it meant that this little rat ran rampant in the meta untouched for almost an entire year, during which he was arguably top 1 and inarguably top 3. GT Goku made his debut in the competitive scene in a big way thanks to Goichi, who at that point was establishing himself as the best player in the world at DBFC by far. Goichi used GT Goku in his team along with Bardock and Super Saiyan Goku at Combo Breaker 2019, a tournament which took place less than a month after GT Goku's release date. A player as good as Goichi bringing a mostly unproven character into tournament meant that they were either extremely curious or confident about the character, but his faith in GT paid off when he won the tournament, taking Grand Finals over Hook Gang God and seemingly causing a GT outbreak that would last for months to come. Of all the players in Top 16 of EVO 2019's DBFC tournament, five of them used GT Goku, including Goichi and Sonic Fox, the two Grand Finalists. In Top 16 of the DBFC 2019-2020 World Tour, 9 out of 16 players used GT Goku, including Goichi and Fenrich, the two Grand Finalists. He was pretty much impossible to escape, and his insane assist and versatile level 3 made him a must-include on your team. It was to the point where some top players were discussing whether or not he should be banned, since he wouldn't get nerfed until all the DLC for Season 2 was released. I'm not a fan of banning characters just because they're too popular or strong, especially in a game like DBFC, and I do genuinely think some of the dialogue around GT Goku's power was very exaggerative. But damn, a character in a game that's not even a fucking decade old being able to generate this much discourse is pretty insane. Eventually, GT Goku's tiny ass was toned down and now he's sort of just a shadow of his former self, but even if he is still a little different, he's very strong and fun, and DBFZ is in a much, much different spot in 2024 than it was in 2019. Still, I'll always have fond memories of just how crazy GT Goku was during his reign of terror in Season 2. Among the many, many arcade games spawned from the success of Street Fighter 2 and the like, Karnov's Revenge, or Fighter's History Dynamite, stands out as one of the best. It's a tight as hell game and really makes me grateful that Fightcade is a thing and lets older games like this be playable online with rollback and foster a community. As far as the top dogs of Karnov, you can take your pick between any of the top four, they're all fucking absurd. 
I assume the one people are most familiar with is the man himself, thanks to Theory Fighter's wonderful video on him, with an infinite and the profoundly busted balloon special move that gives him access to cross-ups and pressure that... Honestly, I feel like he really shouldn't have in a game of this age and style. We won't be discussing Karnob though, or Zazie, or Lee. Instead, we're going to be focusing on Ray. Ray McDougal. Unserious last name aside, Ray is one of the most fearsome characters Karnov's has to offer, and most of that is focused on one special move that defines his game plan. Baby steps, though. You could probably tell by his anime hair and the legally distinct Shoto pose, but Ray is essentially meant to fill the main character niche, acting as a fairly simple beginner character who can fill multiple playstyles. However, he goes above and beyond that in more ways than just one. Ray is blessed with an extremely strong fireball, the Big Tornado, or Baked Potato, you can decide for yourself which one is more accurate, is a standard projectile with two different versions that differ in travel speed. Jumping is definitely something Ray likes his opponents to do, and a fireball is the perfect way to force a careless opponent right into that situation. He can also zone characters with poor mobility or lacking anti-fireball tools like Ryoko and Marstorius. So as a defensive character, he has his fireball, but when Mr. McDougal wants to go on the offensive, he pulls out his dynamite tackle and his best-in-class normals. Tons of amazing pokes can make him a nightmare to approach, and his jump heavy kicks cross-up potential can make him very scary to block when he's in the air. Dynamite Tackle might seem like an odd tool for a Shoto, but Ray is no mere Shoto, my friend. The Tackle goes basically full screen if you use the Heavy Punch version and is a primo combo and block string tool since it knocks down on hit and is basically safe if blocked. More than that, Dynamite Tackle can allow for tricky setups due to how far it travels, such as using the move at full screen and having it whiff, then throwing the opponent since the Tackle will put you in throw proximity. For a game of this style with no forward dashes, Ray's mobility with the Tackle is genuinely impressive. This fucker can move like a bullet, which can make him hard to pin down altogether. Oh yeah, and he can also perform an enhanced dynamite tackle, which is his hidden move, and that does even better damage at the end of combos. Strong damage and good zoning and rushdown is what Ray excels at, and this conversions of offense and defense is all tied together by his best tool and one of the most fearsome special moves ever, the wheel kick. Wheel kick is an absolute monster of an attack, be it high level or low level, offense or defense. To quote the super combo page for Ray, if Ryoko, who was considered a bottom tier, had this move, she would be top tier. Wheel Kick does everything. It's a reversal, it's a movement tool, it's an anti-air, it's an anti-fireball, it's a combo ender, and if you ask nicely, it'll probably file your taxes for you. Wheel Kick's lightning fast startup, insane travel speed, startup and vulnerability, and recovery make it an amazing tool for contesting almost anything your opponent does. Any fireball that your opponent even thinks about throwing, Wheel Kick will fly right through it. As an anti-air, it's one of the best, and considering Ray's own fireball can naturally incentivize opponents to jump, he can control airspace better than almost anyone. As for what Ray gets off a successful Wheel Kick anti-air, it's important to remember that Wheel Kick does not cause a knockdown on an airborne opponent. However, the recovery is so goddamn fast that you can usually set yourself up for a meaty or backdash to maintain distance before the opponent has landed, leaving Ray with a heavy advantage after a successful anti-air. In a lot of cases, you'll even be able to Wheel Kick through certain special moves that make the opponent airborne just because of Wheel Kick's invincibility. Against certain characters like Matlock and Young Me, and even super top tier Karnob, this can give Ray an easy ride through the matchup. Actually, Ray boasts a very good strategy against Karnob, since he can completely change how Karnob uses the balloon. If he does this move carelessly, his fat ass will get shot out of the sky with a wheel kick. Ray's ability to control the pace of a match is unparalleled. There's just so much he can shut down with the wheel kick, and even just the threat of wheel kick alone is enough to make the opponents play in a suboptimal way that he can take advantage of. He can even use Wheel Kick's insane travel range to escape the corner, since it's also usable in the air. Do note that the Heavy Kick version, while boasting superior vertical range, has way more recovery since Ray takes longer to land. Also, it doesn't hit crouching opponents. Hey, I said it was an amazing move. I didn't say it was flawless. It's easy to get into a pattern of Wheel Kicking the shit out of everything your opponent does, so make sure you're you know, actually punishing stuff and not just throwing it out willy-nilly, because if your opponent catches on to what you're doing and manages to avoid wheel kick, you will suffer the consequences of your carelessness. Ray's versatility makes him a contender for the top spot. He's just so good at so many different things, and being able to adapt on the spot can allow you to make Ray nigh untouchable. Of course, he doesn't completely shut down all the cast members. Zazie, who was also a top tier, seems to give him major trouble since Zazie also has very good pokes and anti-fireball tools. 
However, Ray's ability to change how he tackles different matchups and characters is precisely why he's so strong. His major flaw, besides any problems with the other top tiers, is his weak spots. In Karnov's Revenge, every character has a weak spot located on their body. Taking too many hits to that area will cause it to flash, and another hit after that is a guaranteed stun. Ray's weak spot is the lightning bolt symbol on the center of his shirt. His strong defensive tools can help keep his opponents away from it, but just be wary because it can be very easy to get stunned if you're hit by stray pokes. Ray himself can actually take advantage of most weak spots on the roster thanks to Thunder Dynamite Tackle though. As far as top Ray players, the one to watch in my opinion is Moon Master, the winner of the Karnov tournament at Frosty Faustings 2024. His matches showcase Ray's offensive and defensive capabilities very well. Man, I sure have been talking about Guilty Gear a lot on this channel, haven't I? What can I say? With the Ark World Tour recently concluding and the announcement of a new DLC character for Strive, it's a good-ass time to get into the series. With that stated, let's talk about Johnny. Resident top tier and absolute husband, Johnny is one of the most fearsome characters in Exerd. I've heard he's pretty fucking whack in Strive, so that may come as a shock to some, but this character was insane. Besides looking, acting, and sounding like the coolest motherfucker on the planet, courtesy of Norio Wakamoto, voice of Cell, and M. Bison, Johnny is absolutely slicing anyone who contests him in neutral thanks to the forefront of his strengths, Mistfinder stance. Mistfinder puts Johnny into a sword slash stance, which will release a sword slash with alarming range when the button used to activate the stance is released. Now by itself, it's a fantastic move for numerous reasons. It contributes to his damage, it reaches fairly far, which combines with his long range pokes to make him quite difficult to approach in neutral, and the stance can be cancelled. Stancels with Johnny allow him to enforce terrifying pressure by making his normal safe or even plus and gives him easy tick throws. And Johnny can combo off his throw even when he's mid-screen, so this is a real party starter. It also destroys projectiles and Johnny can use misstep to continue moving even while in the stance. The fact that it can be held makes it great for baiting bursts and punishing the opponent severely in those scenarios. Did I miss anything? Oh yeah, High Mist Finer is air unblockable unless the opponent uses faultless defense. Alright then. The insane thing is, all of these strengths I mentioned only covers level 1 Mist Finer, which is only the beginning of how fucking ridiculous this attack is. Johnny has a special which tosses a coin out, and if this coin hits, Mist Finer will be powered up. It maxes out at level 3, and upon getting to that point, the fun really begins. Johnny's damage with Mist Finer level 3 is obscene. While the properties of the slash slightly differ based on which version is used, they all pick up higher damage and greater combo opportunities for Johnny to capitalize on. It also makes the Mistfinder stancels even faster and lets him be even more plus when pressuring you. All of this stands to make Johnny's offense beyond versatile, but what really seals the deal is just how well it loops into itself. Coins can be used as a combo ender after a Mistfinder starter to guarantee level 3 again after using it, which is important as Mistfinder's level resets every time the move is used, regardless of if it hits or not. A combo ended with coins leads into more Mistfinder damage, which leads into another coin ender for more levels, and the whole thing just snowballs into pain and misery for the opponent, which makes Johnny insanely strong at capitalizing off of momentum. And all of this neutral dominance and insane offense is just off of one move. His other specials have their moments though. Bacchus Sign is an excellent Oki tool that gives Mistfinder another buff. While the mist from Bacchus Sign is on the opponent, Mistfinder will cause them to stumble if it's blocked, which gives Johnny fucking unblockable setups. Bacchus Sign's slow startup means that you have to sacrifice a stronger conventional Oki to set it up, but it's fine because unblockables. Note that the opponent can blitz to avoid it, but uh, if they don't have the meter, then good luck for them. His uses for the meter he builds are seemingly endless. He can use Zweihander in combination with Roman cancels to create seriously strong mix-ups, and the air momentum from the cancel lets him move extremely fast through the air. He has two supers, one of which is a strong combo ender and also basically impossible to punish, making it a great reversal, and the other allowing Johnny to somewhat replenish his coin count, and that's on top of universal stuff like Blitz. This fucker's offensive versatility is off the charts. However, all of these strengths do come at the cost of fairly high difficulty, not just in combo execution, although that can definitely be one of the barriers to being a strong Johnny player, but also Mistfinder stancels. Not to mention having to manage coins and keep track of your Mistfinder level, since the game only displays it while you're in the stance. 
Not having coins can make Johnny substantially weaker, so wasting your coins seriously cripples the character. Johnny can certainly be a balancing act, but the reward of a character with such insane normals, pressure, damage, mix-ups, momentum, and strong matchup spread is well worth it, which we can see with the strongest Johnny player in Exerd, Omito. From 2016 to 2019, Omito took Johnny to the highest level of play and went on a tear through the Exert meta. He got second place at EVO 2016 during the Rev 1 era in an incredibly close set with Machibu and would later go on to win EVO 2017 and 2018 with Johnny. The crazy part about EVO 2018 is that he ended up playing Machibu again, first in winners finals and then grand finals, and won both sets. He also won the ARC Revo 2019 tournament, which I believe was basically the top 8 of the ARC System Works World Tour that they do. Omito's Johnny absolutely beasted through so many players and he really did open up the potential of this character's insane offense. I'd really recommend giving him a watch, because his Johnny is a work of art and some of the cleanest and coolest play I've ever seen. So, Garo Mark of the Wolves is a pretty fun game. I've been learning it recently with friends, and despite some reservations, like how insanely annoying trying to anti-air in this game is, I am having quite a lot of fun. So naturally, I figure I should talk about one of the characters I've been playing since she's very strong. B. Jeanette, or Janae, however the fuck you say it. In a game where there's plenty of jumping to be found, Janae controls the air and ground with extremely strong pressure. Between her and Cammy, I think my type is just top tier white women with good dive kicks. Janae's moveset is… weird. I don't know if it's just me, but something about her array of special moves feels very strange and not cohesive. Not that they aren't strong. Her fireball isn't very conventional, since it crawls along the ground very slowly. The long startup means it's not a viable zoning option, but it's quite good for corner pressure and okizema, especially the light version since it comes out faster. 214A slash C is a block string ender and combo tool, and 236B slash D do the same thing, but this move can also be broken. Breakable moves in Garo can have their animations cancelled halfway through, allowing you to maintain frame advantage on a normally unsafe move. 214B slash D is an overhead with pretty far reach on the D version and air to air potential. Altogether a solid set of moves, but they pale in comparison to the real breadwinner of this pirate's toolkit, Harrier B. 2B or 2D in the air will cause Janae to begin flying at a set path. This move is a dive kick and a reka at the same time and is a supremely annoying option that gives Janae some of the best offense in the game. By tapping the button used to initiate the dive kick, Janae will perform up to 4 follow up kicks. There's a lot that this move can do for you. With the proper spacing, the reka can be safe and even plus. This is the forefront of Janae's offense, which is already pretty crazy. She has very good pressure buttons, including her godlike 2B, and her faint cancels let her stay in the opponent's face for an unreasonable amount of time. She even has access to an infinite on hit and block, although it is pretty difficult to do. The dive kick though is on a different level. The fact that the kicks are just one button makes them extremely easy to hit confirm, and after that you can jump into another dive kick, go for another block string, go for throw. Her options off a dive kick are really versatile. On top of that, they do unreasonable amounts of damage and all but the first kick knock down, so Janae's strong offense can loop into itself. The far length that the dive kick travels lets her straight up nullify many characters in neutral. It's a crazy option for whip punishing and makes pressing buttons or even jumping very hard to do when Janae is in the air. With access to such options and good damage, all things considered, Janae can be an absolute nightmare to block. However, Just Defend, which is one of Garo's main defensive mechanics, can take a lot of the sting out of her dive kicks if you have the timing down. Don't get me wrong, it's still an insane move, but if the opponent can JD or god forbid guard cancel that shit, you might be in trouble. It gets even more insane when you consider backdashing. Backdashing in Garo is fully invincible, and Janae's backdash animation sends her into the air, allowing her to cancel it into dive kick. It's a good corner escape option and an excellent way to bait a whip and punish it with high damage reward. Fantastic offense that loops into itself makes Janae one of the best characters in the game, but her main flaw is her low defense which makes her quite easy to kill should you catch her. Definitely something to worry about, especially if a character has a level 2 super loaded up, because one anti-air super can make Jeanette bleed. Still, this character is an absolute beast offensively and a ton of fun to play at that. Janae is represented by numerous strong players such as Wata, Kota, and Tanaka, who managed to win the Garo tournament at EVO Japan 2023 with her strong pressure and mobility. The one constraint is that you will, and I mean you will, get tired of that <laughs> sound. Might be beneficial to keep the game on mute against or as this character, just for the sake of your sanity. 
There are some FGC running gags that make me really sad about how they inhibit the potential player base of a game. Some may look at it solely as the funny bathroom game, but Melty Blood Actress Again Current Code is one of the most fun fighting games out there, especially for how easily accessible it is. You can play it for free via the Community Edition, which also has rollback! On top of the great movement and fast pace, AACC is most notable for its large cast of 31 characters which is bolstered by the moon system, giving each character three variations you can play as. Each moon offers different universal benefits while also changing certain moves for characters. For example, with Alko, her crescent moon form has two types of orbs which she can set down. Her 236A is a short burst of energy while 236B is a chargeable laser. However, in her full moon form, she trades the laser for a more conventional fireball and a DP, and in Half Moon, she loses her ability to set orbs on the ground, instead having a more traditional grounded projectile. It's important to keep in mind which version best suits your playstyle because the changes across characters can be very comprehensive. For the top tiers of this game, well, it's a pretty old game and the gap in tiers can be very noticeable. A character like Neko Arc probably won't be able to keep up with the likes of Hime or Kohaku, regardless of moons, but today I want to talk about Roa, and in particular, the Crescent Moon form. See Roa is commonly referred to by the community with the nickname of War Crime, and believe me, if there's ever a character that deserved it. Good old Honest Mids Michael's winning smile and flowing locks give way to one of the most oppressive characters ever seen in any anime game. In the olden days of Melty Blood, C. Roa was supposedly one of the worst characters in the game and undeniably the least powerful of the three Roa moons, but AACC buffed him, and they buffed him hard. He's now a contender for top 1. Roa is meant to be a set play character, which means he wants to score a knockdown, then set up some sort of move that allows him to continue his pressure. In regards to this, he has more than a few moves that make his pressure absolutely monstrous. 236A is a short range lightning attack, but it can be cancelled, even on block, into 22A, and combined with reverse beat, which is a mechanic which allows you to cancel stronger normals into weaker ones in a string or combo, Roa has easy access to plus frames for bullying opponents in the corner. Already, this makes him pretty scary. 22A and 22B themselves are interesting as they let him power up his 22C. He can charge it up to 9 times, with each consecutive charge improving the move's damage and giving it new properties. At charge level 9, the lightning release becomes air unblockable and Roa can score some juicy damage off of it. Roa's main tool though are his orbs. These are what define him and make him so insurmountable in battle. 214X will set down one orb on screen. He can do this on the ground and in the air and the orbs can be powered up by holding the button used to set it down. A regular orb is plus 18 on block. That's pretty absurd. If you decide to charge it, it becomes plus 26. With how fast Roa can set them down thanks to the charged version being cancelable into itself, Roa's neutral is some of the best in the game. Grounded orbs are a bit slower to set, but considering Roa's pressure is already so good thanks to 2-2A cancels, you can probably sneak him in without much trouble. The reward Roa gets off these orbs is genuinely unbelievable to me. On hit, he gets a combo, and his damage off of a triple orb detonation is insane. We're talking upwards of 6k on a double or triple orb starter. On block, they're still cursed, because Roa still gets mad chip damage off of orbs, and they also rip through guard gauge like nothing else. On top of that, orbs build Roa tons and tons of meter even if blocked, and this is important because it gives him access to 236C, which is another pivotal tool for Roa. It's a fast, air unblockable super that travels almost full screen and pushes the opponent back tremendously, giving Roa excellent corner carry. For 100 meter, this super is an astoundingly good tool that gives Roa further dominance over neutral. Even in this scenario, just playing your game against Roa can be extremely difficult. With orbs on screen and access to 236C, Roa's control of neutral is near uncontestable. He can whiff punish almost anything the opponent does and the reward on hit for him is gigantic. Once he gets you locked in the corner, escaping Roa's optimized pressure is an extremely difficult task for many characters. Even if you manage to get out of the corner, the air orbs change direction, so you're not safe from their grasp. This property of the orbs enables left-right mix as well. Do keep in mind that Roa's orbs disappear after some time. It's probably nothing to be worried about. You'll definitely end up detonating them before that point. Just try not to play with your food, lest you be left with no orbs to cover yourself. So with access to constant plus frames, godlike control of the screen, and high damage, you'd think his weakness would be his defense, right? If you did think that, go back over your notes, because you clearly weren't paying attention to what kind of video you're watching. Roa has a DP. 623B is completely invincible on startup and will allow him to blow through medias like it ain't no thing. 
He also has his 2C, which moves him forward and causes a hard knockdown, which gives him a great way to challenge pressure. It's 9 frame startup, so not the fastest Abare button, but still solid. Roa is a domineering offensive force. Fighting Roa is so hard because he just clutters the screen with garbage and gets the most ridiculous reward off of said garbage. Even a risk as minor as throwing out one normal can allow Roa to slaughter you with an orb release or 236C. The best counterplay to Roa is to rush him down before he can set his orbs down. Although his mobility is good, it's melty so he has air dashes and his ground dash is pretty fast and far moving too. Most characters can actually run and he does lose the mobility battle to other more nimble characters. Pinning Roa down before he can toss orbs is crucial, but you also can't just autopilot your offense on him due to his DP and the universal defensive mechanic of shield and heat, so be cautious to maintain a good balance of locking him down and watching out for his defensive options. His aim normals are pretty stubby too, so take advantage of that. He also comes with fairly difficult execution to perform his special cancels and combos, which at this point barely feels like a flaw in the first place. Roa is represented in a high level by numerous strong players. Korodine is an American C Roa player who won the AACC tournament at CEO Taku 2023, beating strong players like Scrot Vermilion and Skeleton to take it home. Definitely the best in the West, and for the beast in the East, we have Red Melon. Yes, they do use a red color, and yes, they are godlike. So yeah, Roa was a nightmare in AACC. It took more than a few buffs from his first appearance. Air orbs not hitting crouchers and not switching sides made him a pretty garbage character in older versions, but he got the glow up of the fucking century and became a powerhouse. Type Lumina is the main melty game now. I don't really follow it now, but I'm sure he was toned down and is no longer a top tier and has no competitive presence. Yup, definitely wasn't played by both grand finalists in Type Lumina at EVO 2023. No way, no how. Okay, so disclaimer for this section, Killer Instinct 2013 is a hard game to research for. The game has lots of really, really good comprehensive resources, such as Infill's Beginner Guide, which is an excellent read if you want to get into the game. However, things kinda got complicated as the game has been receiving balance patches over the past few months. I've seen some talk about the meta and how things have changed, and some of the resources are getting updated, but if some things in this section are inaccurate to the game's current form, I apologize for that. Anyway, Killer Instinct is like THE gimmick game. Almost everyone in this roster of crazy characters has some unique shit going on, presumably to make up for the universal combo system and combo breakers. Conversely, it's a remarkably well-balanced game from what I've seen. I think the lowest tier I've ever seen in any tier list is B, although I don't know how accurate it is now with the Anniversary Edition patch. Anyway, let's talk about perhaps the craziest character in this cacophony of chaos, Arya. The reason I call her the craziest is because Arya is not one character, but three, rolled up into one neat, highly versatile package. Arya's main gimmick is her three bodies, each of which change her normals, specials, and overall game plan in various ways. KI doesn't have rounds, instead they have two health bars. Arya says, fuck your convention, and comes in with three health bars, each representing her different bodies. Here's the rundown. Base body, blade body, booster body. Learn these six Bs because they're going to be integral to your success with Arya. Arya can switch between these bodies at any time she's not attacking or defending, although it does take a bit of time to actually do it, so you can be punished if you do it willy-nilly. Boost body specialty is mobility and mix. She gains access to a tackle which can be used in the air and can start combos on hit, and you can hold up at the peak of your jump to hover, letting you do tricky left-right mix-ups or plain crush low poke attempts. Blade Body is tailored to be more focused on traditional grounded offense, evident by the faster walk speed and long range pokes that Arya gains access to. Arya also gains an invincible DP and a 20 frame command overhead, so it's certainly a force to be reckoned with on the ground. Finally, Base Body is where Arya becomes a zoner, with strong projectiles that allow her to control the screen. She has low and anti-air versions, and the move can be enhanced with a bar of shadow meter to basically cover all three trajectories. This form also has way, way faster dashes, useful for creating distance. Already sounds like a lot to balance, even with the specials and normals shared between all three forms, you're essentially playing three different characters. Well, there's a bit more to it. You see, whichever body is out on the field fighting will be accompanied by two other drones, and these drones can essentially be used as assist calls for the main body. Yep, you can probably see where this is going. You're playing a Marvel character. 
Each assist is different, but they all cater to similar niches as the actual bodies. The base assist is particularly good as it's a full screen volley of projectiles, but all three of them can definitely be useful. It should be made clear that Arya's strengths are definitely outmatched in some ways. Base body isn't the best pure zoner, boost body doesn't have the best mix, yada yada. What makes Arya so strong is the sheer versatility of being able to utilize these kits all at once with assists. She can cover a wide spectrum of matchups and she has tools for anything the other characters can throw at her. And I mean, even if she isn't the best at each body's specialty, she's still fucking insane as a rushdown or zoner character, with strong mix, good buttons, and great damage. Also, according to the anniversary patch notes, she's considered the hardest character in the game to break, and I can only imagine that's because of the insane amount of specials she has that can be used as extenders. Feel free to correct me on that. Her two universal specials are Shotgun Blitz, which is an advancing move with good range that can hop right over lows, and Explosive Arc, which has upper body invincibility and can be used as a block string ender. Arya is the queen of versatility, and that becomes obvious when you pop her Instinct. Instinct is a mini install that you can access once this little meter under your health bar is full. For most characters, it unlocks pivotal offensive options, but Arya's is, uh, a bit more unique. While in Instinct mode, Arya combines the three bodies and has access to the unique specials of all three, while also giving her a new assist that's uh, pretty insane. On top of essentially unlocking her full potential as a character, it gives her the chance to save a body that might be low on health, since the Instinct will automatically switch her to whichever body has the most health remaining. Arya's biggest issue is how fragile she is. Her health between bodies is reduced to make up for the fact that she essentially has an extra health bar over everyone else, but this creates another unique problem for her, which is her snowballing potential. And I don't mean snowballing into wins. Quite the opposite, actually. Arya losing a health bar means losing an extra set of moves and more importantly, losing an assist. Everyone else is pretty much the same character across both health bars. But Arya gets significantly weaker with each life lost. KI is a very offensively volatile game, and it's easy to get smoked off of a few bad guesses, but Arya feels this worse than many other characters because of her lower health and how hard she's affected by the loss of a body. Playing Arya can be very unforgiving. She obviously doesn't have hard combo execution, and her special move inputs are pretty conventional, but the difficulty is rooted in having to manage so much. Even just keeping track of which body is blade, boost, and base is making my fucking brain leak out of my ears, so you can imagine how that difficulty translates to actual gameplay. The task is definitely hard, but if you keep track of the bodies and you've got your combo breakers on point, you can definitely make her work. The reward is certainly worth it. For strong Arya players, we have Da Chronicle and Extreme Zombie, both of which have managed to achieve top 8 and even victories at the likes of Combo Breaker 2022 and 2023, and Tampa never sleeps. This one was actually post-anniversary patch, so that's pretty impressive. I find it interesting from the matches I've watched, both seem to primarily prefer sticking to boost body and only seem to switch when the bodies get low on HP. I don't know if this is the optimal playstyle as I haven't seen all of Arya's matchups, but I suppose the wonder of a character like Arya is that you can choose whether to ride out the time with a body until you lose it, or you can switch constantly and you can choose whichever body to do it with. Pretty sick concept for a character honestly, but then again, that's just Killer Instinct 2013's MO. In the low tiers video, I ended things off with a pretty over the top example of a character who was extremely underpowered. I can't imagine I could find a character who's dramatically stronger than anyone I've discussed here unless I pull out something obvious like Ivan Ooze, so what do you say we end things off simple and clean? For the finale of this video, I want to discuss Izanami from Blaze Blue Central Fiction. Izanami is an offensive powerhouse despite some barriers to entry and has one of the most fearsome defensive tools in any Arxis game. Izanami's movement is slightly unique amongst the Blaze Blue cast since she doesn't possess a double jump. Instead, tapping up twice will enable one of her best pressure tools, which is a float. Izanami floating is crazy because it essentially acts the same as the floor, and what this means is that while she's floating, she can still use her grounded normals in the air. With the limited airtime of floating, you can put together some crazy pressure sequences. Izanami can also cancel the float early, so her high-low is extremely strong. As a base, this very good mix makes Izanami formidable on offense, so you better be ready to block your heart out, not to mention looking out for her regular throw and command throw, but things get even crazier when we throw in her drive. For the uninitiated, drive in Blaze Blue is basically every character's unique, character-defining gimmick. You can liken the D button to passive stand character's S moves in Heritage for the Future, where it does something a little different for everyone. 
Izanami's drive is a mode switch that causes the little rings floating near her back to expand into a triangle of projectiles a la the Triad Thunder from Mega Man X3. In this state, Izanami gains access to some very pivotal moves. 41236D will attract the opponent which makes it a good tool for approaching and also letting her make certain moves safe. Perfect example is 214B which is basically a full screen low slide. It's a tricky option to throw out since he can use it in the air thanks to Izanami's float but it's unsafe on block at minus 9. With 41236D though, it can be much harder to punish. 63214D is her primary Okizeme tool, allowing her to beat many wake up options and continue her pressure. However, she can also fire the projectiles that hover around her at different angles. There's a slight cooldown after using them so you can't just spam the thing, but holy shit is it nice for letting her cover herself in neutral while also letting her keep her turn even after block strings. However, Izanami's drive does have one pretty big boon to counteract the offensive prowess it offers. While her D is out, Izanami cannot block. At all. This is a pretty big flaw, huh? Well, it is, for sure. But Izanami has ways to cover for it, and it's all thanks to one extremely powerful special move, 623B. This move is called Shield of Dreams, although the community commonly gives it the nickname Ribcage, or just Ribs. Izanami Ribcage is a fucking stupid tool that can make her nigh impossible to contest on defense if used properly. While Ribcage is active, Izanami gains perpetual guard point that lasts for the duration of the move. If you're not familiar with what Guard Point is, it's sort of like an alternative version of standard invincibility. When a character enters a state of invincibility, any attacks that make contact with their hurtbox will pass through them. In Guard Point state, your hurtbox behaves like normal but you just won't suffer damage or hit stun. It's essentially like armor but you won't take damage and there's no fear of getting armor broken. And Izanami Ribcage just lets her have constant access to it while still moving and attacking. It's not like it's part of some specific attack or super, she just turns it on and bam, now you just can't attack her. Rips are completely uncontestable. Strikes, specials, drive moves, even supers will be rendered completely ineffective by the ribcage. Lots of characters in Blaze Blue can subject you to crazy sequences of offensive pressure, but what makes Izanami's so ridiculous is that her ribs make her pressure pretty much impossible to check. When these things are out, you hold it and fucking pray, cause ain't no reversals or a bar are gonna save you. Of course there is a limit on the rib gauge, otherwise this character would probably be banned. Izanami's ribs drain from the barrier gauge. Barrier in Blaze Blue is essentially an upgraded version of standard blocking. It reduces chip damage, increases pushback, and allows you to block attacks that would otherwise be air unblockable. Izanami can do barrier like everyone else, but the gauge will also drain while ribs are activated. She has access to another special move that cancels ribs and can be comboed into to preserve barrier, but it's imperative to make sure barrier does not drain. If your barrier gauge empties, you enter danger state, where the damage you take is increased until the barrier gauge is refilled. In some situations, it might be beneficial to enter this state so that the meter refills faster, but in general, make sure to make the most out of your time with rib cage so you aren't wasting it and then getting pounded into non-existent while in your most vulnerable state, especially since Izanami can't block while using her drive. Hitting rib cage will further diminish the barrier gauge, so it's not completely infallible either. Oh yeah, and you can still be thrown while ribs are active. Remember that. Izanami can struggle if the opponent manages to run away from her onslaught while rib cage is out, but if she locks you down, you ain't getting out. Izanami is represented at the highest level by Riku Toe, who got third place at EVO Japan 2019, although there are lots of other strong players I've seen in exhibitions. One final thing, she can stop time. Fuck, and I just brought up Heritage for the future to make a comparison between passive stands and drive. What are the chances? So that's it for this nonsense. I love making these videos to showcase multiple games and characters all at once in a more simplified and easy to digest manner. Make sure to let me know who your favorite top tiers are, and also whether you prefer playing characters that are considered strong or weak. Thank you for watching, have a great night, and take care. Hey guys, this is the part of the video where I shout out my channel members, so thank you to Old Man Han. You can become a channel member with the link in the description, it's only $2.99 and comes with various perks. Thank you for watching, have a great night, and take care.